Some of them live among us, as our friends, companions and helpers. But deep in their genes lies a communion with their killing cousins. The canines are among the oldest surviving carnivore families on Earth, honing their predatory perfection over millions of years. Sometimes they hunt alone. Acrobatic, airborne and insatiable. Often they hunt as bands of brothers and sisters capable of pulling down prey ten times their size and eating them alive. For almost 40 million years, the family of the dog has been built for the kill. They inhabit every continent except Antarctica. Across Asia, Africa, the Arctic, South America. The exquisitely designed predator that is the dog takes many killing forms. But the kindred spirit that gave rise to Carnis familiaris our beloved companions, is the wolf. Every single breed of domestic dog, large and small, swift and not so swift, hard-working and merely decorative, is a descendant of Carnis lupus, the grey wolf. Perhaps our hunter-gatherer forebears admired the wolf for its likeness to them. Travelling in bands of hunters who work together to bring down prey large enough to feed the whole group. To this day, humans have tapped into the domestic dog's wolfish characteristics to serve our own ends. Even the instincts of the gentlest herding dogs are believed to be modified versions of the wolf's genetic programming to hunt. While the wolves that threw their lot in with humans prospered, the wild wolves became pariahs to many. Today there are tens of millions of dogs in the world and some 120,000 wolves. Perhaps because the wolves wanted what we wanted. Big game. But the wolves that survive today remain completely built for the kill, from nose to tail. The wolf's nose is extraordinarily acute, recognizing and analyzing hundreds of thousands of chemical traces that no human can sense. It can smell prey up to two kilometers away. Its sense of hearing is equally acute. Large pointed ears gather faint sounds from great distances and the skull is designed with large cavities that amplify sound. Under ideal conditions, the wolf can hear prey moving over 16 kilometers away. But there is another weapon at work here. Its skull is designed to house a large brain with a complex cerebral cortex. It's this brain, some 30% larger proportionately than that of a domestic dog, that plays a key role in the wolf's closely coordinated style of hunting, its intricate ways of communicating, and its extremely social lifestyle. are led by an alpha pair who enforce a strict hierarchy. Younger siblings and grown pups of the alpha pair come next in the pyramid of power. 
Then come the pups of the season. Serious fighting is rarely necessary to maintain the social order. The wolf's complex range of body language usually does the trick. On the northern American continent, where the first member of the dog family made its appearance some 37 million years ago, the grey wolf makes its home. Sometimes grey in name only, the wolf can be almost black. And in the far north, its coat is often white. The hunt often begins with a rousing group howl. Howling notifies members of the group to gather. It also warns other wolves to keep off the pack's territory. Remarkably, nearby herds of prey seem to pay no attention to the haunting call to arms of the great predator. The body of the wolf is built for both endurance and speed. Unlike members of the cat family who tend to ambush prey, the wolf is made for the long haul. Its limbs are long and sturdy, and its loping style of attack can play out over miles and hours. Powerfully muscled hind limbs provide bursts of speed of up to 45 kilometers per hour. While tough, non-retractile claws provide traction. Those big paws can splay out as the wolf runs, allowing it to run on the surface of crusted snow while its victim's thin hooves crash through. The hunt itself is carefully coordinated, usually by one of the alpha pair, the older, more experienced hunters. Lower ranking members of the pack take turns testing prey animals by sprinting after them. Looking for any sign of weakness or fatigue, while others lope along, conserving energy for the final sprint. During the chase, Predator and prey actually communicate with each other. This head up, high stepping trot is the elk's way of telling the wolf, Look how strong and fit I am. I don't even need to gallop away from you, so don't bother coming after me. This gait is called stotting. Remarkably, though, the wolves know when the elk are lying. Sensing vulnerability, they press their advantage and make the kill. Once a wolf latches on, powerful facial muscles go to work, holding five centimeter long canine teeth in a vice-like hold. Wolves have 42 teeth, all dedicated to the processing of meat. Specialized molars and premolars called carnassials have evolved to shear and mash flesh. Matters of hierarchy are strictly enforced during feeding time. The alpha pair feed first. Grey wolves can consume nearly 10 kilos of flesh at a sitting. But with a pack this size, it won't last long. And soon, the synchronized killing will begin again. Next up, the wild dogs of Africa and Asia. Super social killers whose lethal ways have often remained a mystery to science and whose bonds give new meaning to family values. And in a remote province of India, a shadowy canine becomes a suspect as a merciless... The Grey Wolf. Beautiful, despised, worshipped and persecuted, is undeniably lethal. But it's just one of many wild canine species around the world that, in their ability to hunt in packs, have become icons of carnage. These are the running dogs, bringing with them death by numbers. They come in many shapes and colors. But what they have in common is in their skulls, big, complex brains. And big brains require a lot of education. Wild dogs who live in packs 
are uncommonly devoted to their young. As with wolves, each pack is led by an alpha pair, usually the only ones who mate. But all of the members of the pack attend to the feeding and education of the pups. This may be because prolactin, a hormone found in nursing mothers, may soar in all members of the pack, male and female, making them all feel nurturing. At least this appears to be the case with wolves. Play helps puppies strengthen growing limbs and develop coordination, things they will need to be physically effective at the hunt. Often, wild dog parents and older siblings bring live animals home to the pups so they can practice their hunting skills. But play also teaches important social lessons, helping them come to terms with their place in the hierarchy of the pack. It's a long growing up period, and the scenes of puppy raising are universally touching. But all of this family bonding has a deadly end. What is being raised is a killer extraordinaire who knows his place and his purpose in the lethal engine of the hunt. In southern Africa, a river called the Okavango meanders into the Kalahari Desert. The individuals all closely bound to the group. The hunt begins in ritualized fashion as the alpha male rouses the troops. Then they set out. About the size of German shepherds when fully grown, these wild dogs have several distinctive characteristics that testify to their ancient lineage. Their middle toes have fused, so they have only four per foot. They also have strong collarbones, which have all but disappeared in most modern dogs. Their strange markings, so different from those of other wild dogs, are probably related to their need to cooperate while hunting. Apparently, they have to recognize and keep track of each other at a distance on the open plains and their odd markings are as distinctive as fingerprints. Leechwe, a kind of antelope, flee before the well-coordinated pack. Long adapted to life in the swampy conditions of the Okavango Delta, the Leechwe move with startling speed and grace through the water. But the dogs are relentless and eventually victorious. It's time to bring home the bacon. In this case, the alpha female is raising two broods, her own and one she has confiscated from a subordinate female. And feeding all these pups is a full-time job. She has as many as 14 teats, a record in the dog world rivaled only by a little wild dog on top of the world, the Arctic Fox. The alpha female demands to be fed, and a returning hunter obligingly regurgitates a meal. The wild dog is Africa's supreme canine long-distance hunter. On the open plains of the Serengeti, where the dogs will tackle prey as large as wildebeest. Patience, endurance and cooperation are hallmarks of its killing ways. It takes teamwork to pull down such a large animal, so some of the wild dogs will try to hamstring it from behind, while others will attack the sensitive nose. Still others will slash at the animal's belly, trying to disembowel it. This is probably one of the reasons that the wild dog has been labelled a murderer and an abomination. But it's simply not built to suffocate its kills the way a big cat might. And once the prey is dead, the dogs are quite orderly. There's no fighting over the carcass. The painted wolf pack is a tight-knit group, with each member knowing his place in the packing order from puppyhood.
with the African wild dog. All for one and one for all is just another way of being built for the kill. All across sub-Saharan Africa, the wide open plains play host to the great migrating herds. These are places where the canine specialty, teamwork, becomes especially lethal. And every year, the rolling grasslands of Tanzania play host to a classic high plains duel. During the wet season, Thompson's gazelles gather here to give birth. Well camouflaged to blend into the grass, the newborn antelope are surprisingly elusive prey. But they're hunted by one of the most fabled canines in the world. In the Middle East, the jackal was the face of the sly trickster of many stories. In ancient Egypt, it was Anubis, the god of the underworld. Even today, the word jackal brings to mind a legendary and deadly cunning. But the jackal is a family-oriented dog, generally monogamous, living in pairs, sometimes with the aid of a helper, a sibling from last year's litter who has stayed on to help raise the pups. Now that the Thompson's gazelles are giving birth, the time to hunt has come. Experience tells the jackals that female Tommies have young nearby. And the mother Tommy is torn between staying far enough away from her newborn's hiding place to keep from giving it away and getting close enough to defend it should the worst happen. But things are beyond her control already. The fawn breaks for it. The fawn is astoundingly fleet and agile for one so young. The mother Tommy runs a zigzag course in front of one jackal, hoping to lure it away from the chase. But the jackal's reputation for cleverness is not undeserved. He won't fall for the trick. Other Tommies join in the defense. But while one jackal takes flight, his mate attacks from the rear. She too is run off by the desperate Tommy mother. For a while, it looks like stalemate. But the jackals seem to sense that it's only a matter of time. Now they attack together, teeth showing and hackles up, and the Tommy mother gives way. It's a brutal end to the young Tommy's life. But a remarkably telling moment in the lives of these killers. While the female feeds, her mate goes off a few yards to keep watch. She's pregnant and needs the food more than he. She eats the first course, the most nutritious part of the carcass. Then the female jackal neatly divides the rest of the carcass in half leaving the remainder for her devoted mate. For the jackal, working together clearly pays off. Studies show that jackals are three times as successful at hunting gazelle fawns when they operate in pairs as when they operate alone. Highly social wild dogs are not relegated to North America and Africa. One of the most social dogs on earth lives elsewhere. This is India. Exotic, mysterious, home of the tiger. And the haunt of a red ghost. One of the most elusive and least understood canines in the world. 
It's the Asiatic wild dog, or dole, and despite its size, about that of a medium domestic dog, the dole is a killer not to be toyed with. In packs, it has been reported to kill leopards and even tigers. And through pack work, the dole gets its tremendous strength and killing potential. But like its African counterpart, this wild dog cultivates its deadly ways in a world of canine kindness. Dolls have been filmed caring for a paralyzed pup for months after it would normally have died. Many a human disappearance was assigned to the packs of the Red Dog during the colonial era. But more recently, another wild dog of India became a suspect in a rash of deaths of children. In Uttar Pradesh in 1996, 76 children were attacked and 46 died a horror committed by a mysterious man-eater. At its peak, the serial killer was taking a child every three days. In India, man-eating leopards and tigers are common. Hyenas and jackals too came under suspicion. But fur found at the scene of one of the crimes, examined under electron micrograph, didn't match the fur of leopards or tigers, or hyenas or jackals. It was wolf hair. This is the Indian wolf. A subspecies of the grey wolf found more commonly in North America and Europe. Where the pressures of human population have not overwhelmed the wilds, the Indian wolf's favorite food is the black buck antelope. Wolves are notoriously shy of humans, and records of wolf attacks are extremely rare. Even the villagers of Uttar Pradesh refuse to believe that wolves could have done it. But there were wolf prints and wolf hair at the scenes of the crimes. Wolves were shot and the killing stopped. In this poor place, human needs have largely driven out the wolf's normal prey. Here too, adults must pay careful attention to the whereabouts of their domestic animals, the family's livelihood. leaving children to mind themselves. Perhaps a starving stray wolf and its pack stumbled upon one of these children and developed a deadly habit. Up next on Built for the Kill, the running dogs who kill in packs may be the most fearsome of predatory canines. But the most successful are often solitary hunters, assassins who kill with spectacular feats of acrobatics. Wild canines, hunting in packs, create a kind of predatory perfection unrivaled on Earth. But the killer dog refuses to be categorized. This endlessly adaptable creature can make a remarkable lone assassin as well. These are the spectacular highlands of Ethiopia, the roof of Africa. It's a stunning natural fortress that harbors the last remnants of an extraordinary canine predator. It has long been called the simian or red jackal, but this rare dog's DNA tells a startlingly different story. It's far more closely related to the wolves of North America than to any wild canine in Africa, and should be called 
the Ethiopian wolf. Like its New World cousins, the Ethiopian wolf lives in socially cohesive packs. And when large prey was available in its range, it probably hunted in packs as well. But now it has been driven into the remotest highlands, where only 400 or so wolves survive on much smaller fare. Though these wolves get together for periodic greetings and border patrol, they go their separate ways to hunt. And their favorite prey is the bizarre-looking giant mole rat, a rodent almost as rare as its predator. Not very keen-sighted, the mole rat peers out of its burrow, apparently oblivious to the hungry wolf at the door. The wolf's hunting method? Pounce and dig like crazy. The mole rat can be dangerous when cornered, but the wolf is hungry. This peculiar rodent will be a fine meal for the wolf, but he has obligations at home as well. For while these wolves hunt alone, they still share their food with their family, sometimes bringing it home whole, so the lessons of the hunt can be passed on to the next generation. Half a world away, another lone wolf hunts on the brink of survival. Although this is a wolf in name only. Deep in Brazil's interior, in the vast grasslands known as the Cerrado, this enigma makes its home. The maned wolf is the last of its kind, a mysterious survivor from a class of wild dogs that goes back six million years. Black maned and long of limb, this elegant creature has been called a fox on stilts. By far the tallest of the canines, the maned wolf's graceful construction is built for the kill. His high vantage allows him to see over the tall grasses in search of his prey. Local legend says this dog can kill with a glance, his eyes full of deadly magic. But his keen nose and large ears hone in on something moving. The maned wolf is not the only creature out tonight who is built for the kill. It's a pit viper, highly venomous, able to kill a human being, but to the wolf, a potential dinner. The maned wolf knows better than to try a frontal attack. He makes his move, going for the viper's tail and avoiding its lethal head. The viper, being eaten alive, makes a final futile strike. But the tall dog seems oblivious, perhaps even immune to its venom. Unlike virtually all of the other canid species, the maned wolves appear to be social loners, coming together only to breed, with the female raising the pups on her own. But they're certainly not the only solitary hunters in the dog family. It's a deadly specialty that falls to the spectacularly successful group of dog cousins known as the foxes. About five million years ago, two main branches of the dog family began to emerge, and the fox-like creatures began to separate from the wolf-like ones. Initially, the foxes weren't as successful as their wolfish cousins. But now that wolves have been eliminated throughout much of the world by human persecution, foxes have become the canny killers that scratch out a living on the fringes of civilization. This is the red fox, the icon of fables, the largest of the surviving foxes and the most widely distributed of the carnivores, found throughout much of the Northern Hemisphere and Australia. The red fox's dazzling specialty, the aerial attack. First order of business, locate the invisible. 
Its keen ears, specially attuned to low frequency sound, can pinpoint the rustling of a hidden rodent to within one degree. Once locked onto its target, the red fox launches its spectacular assault. Propelling itself upward with its hind legs. These are larger proportionately than the hind limbs of any other wild dog. If it's going for distance, the red fox takes off at a 45 degree angle and can cover five meters. But needing extra height and force to punch through crusted snow, it can take off at a remarkable 80 degree angle. The red fox is also lighter than comparably sized cousins, helping it to achieve maximum airtime. And in midair, the fox flails its tail to steer last minute course corrections. Then it makes a precision landing, pinning a hapless rodent. Many of the canines take predatory flight, and even many of their larger lupine cousins are quite adept at the acrobatics of mousing. But none so splendidly as the red fox. The top of the world is a brutal place to try to scratch at a living. But even here, the family of the dog has found a way. Halfway between the northernmost tip of Norway and the North Pole lie the islands of Svalbard. In winter, an ice-locked archipelago onto which predators can come and go as they please, so long as they can stand the cold. In winter, the Arctic fox sports a spectacular white coat, the warmest of any mammals. To limit heat loss, this fox has shorter ears, legs and tail than its other fox cousins. This dog is so built for the chill that it only begins to shiver at nearly 100 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. That's minus 70 degrees centigrade. Another handy feature in its snowy home is the dense fur covering its paws. Its Latin name is Lagopus, or rabbit-footed. Under these extreme circumstances, the little Arctic fox is an opportunist as well as a hunter. Happy to dog the heels of another killer, the polar bear. He shadows the predatory powerhouse snatching leftovers and hiding them in the Arctic's natural freezers. During the brief summers of the far north, the Arctic fox sheds its winter white in favor of the blue grays and browns of its surroundings. This is a time of plenty for the fox who is now in full hunting mode. On the cliffs of an Arctic island, tens of thousands of guillemots have made their nests. The strongest of the birds have fought hard to nest mid-cliff, in the safest part. Those near the top are vulnerable. escapes with her prize egg and buries it. But a more substantial meal awaits her in just a few weeks. Now it's time for the Guillemot chicks to make their perilous debuts, despite the fact that they can't quite fly yet. They'll have to glide to the water below 
several hundred feet down. Adult escorts see to the safety of most, but some lose their way and blunder into the waiting beaks of giant glaucous gulls. And some fall short of the ocean altogether. The little arctic fox seizes her opportunity. It's food for her own brood. And a toy to hone their own budding killer instincts. They had better make hay while the sun shines. The cruelly short arctic summer is almost over. And the little canines will have to survive the chill darkness of the long winter night. top of the world to southernmost Africa, and from extremes of cold to a sun-scorched expanse. This is another kind of desolation. It's the Kalahari Desert, a vast thirst land of baking temperatures, which some years sees no rainfall at all. But an astonishing array of animals manages not only to survive here, but to thrive. And while some killers specialize in the Kalahari's big game, others have dug out another niche altogether. These enormous ears belong to the bat-eared fox, a hardy little predator in a harsh world. With flimsier teeth than any other fox, the bat-eared fox may not be a fox at all. In fact, its ancestors go all the way back to the wolf-fox split in evolution. Weighing in at just over four kilos, the bat-eared fox has to be wary of its canine cousins, the jackals. and its ability to change direction at a flat run without losing speed comes in quite handy here. While at rest, the fox's unmistakable ears radiate heat. Blood circulates over the ear's expansive surface to cool before being recirculated into the body. While on the prowl, those same ears act as giant sand catchers collecting the scurrying sounds of prey as efficiently as radar receivers. A scorpion would seem an unlikely meal, but the bat-eared fox is apparently immune to its stinging tail. The bat-eared fox rarely drinks, living off the liquids in its prey. And a favorite prey is the termite. Now the fox's remarkably engineered jaw comes into play. Because termites move so quickly, the bat ear's lower jaw has evolved a unique flange paired with powerful muscles. It can snap up termites at the speed of three chews per second. From the desert to the Arctic. From the mountains to the sea, the foxes of the world are consummate survivors and utterly built for the kill. Still to come on Built for the Kill, what happens when killer canines go up against each other? On the epic battleground of North America's Yellowstone National Park, it's literally a dog-eat-dog -dog world. For all of the bonding that goes on within dog packs, and pairs who often mate for life, there's no love lost between wild dogs of different species, or even different families. A startling cause of death for wild canines is often wild canines. A 
against the backdrop of Yellowstone National Park, a place of spectacular beauty. A real High Plains American drama is unfolding. Here, the geothermal wonders of a volcanic hotspot play host to a splendid diversity of wildlife. And here, for millennia, the coyote lived in the shadow of the wolf. About half the size of its big cousin, with a relatively sharper snout and larger ears, the coyote is less likely to form packs and more likely to live as a scavenger and hunter of small things. But then, for 60 years, the wolf disappeared from Yellowstone shot, poisoned, and trapped into extinction. And the coyote stepped into the void. Taking on the ways of the top dog, the coyote began forming large packs with strict hierarchies, coordinating its hunts to bring down the big prey of Yellowstone. Those were glorious times for the smaller predator. But in 1996, all that changed. Then came the return of the wolf. No one knew what would happen when Canadian grey wolves were reintroduced into the park by biologists, hoping to restore the ecosystem to an old order. What happened for most scavengers was an unmitigated bonanza. The wolves turned out to be spectacularly suited to life in the park, leaving a trail of carcasses in their wake. Some wolves proved relatively tolerant of coyotes at their kills, but some did not. In the depths of winter, this hungry coyote cannot resist the lure of an elk carcass. He checks the landscape. The wolves, full and drowsy, seem to pose no threat. Little does he know that this one wolf, the alpha female of the pack, is infamous for coyote killing. She has even assassinated other wolves from rival packs. She stalks him as she would any prey. Taking her lead, others in the pack begin to circle the hungry and oblivious coyote. The coyote is doomed. Adult coyote numbers have fallen by half in the parts of Yellowstone where the wolf has been reintroduced. But their pup survival rate is actually up. But this is an old tale. Wherever canine species come up against each other, around the world, bloodshed results. Wolves kill other wolves. Foxes kill foxes. Jackals kill bat foxes. And so on, up and down the food chain. It's just another way that nature assures that her top predators are fit enough to survive in a harsh world. Whether running down prey together with the relentless precision of a killing machine on the plains of North America or Tanzania. Soaring high in the lonely attacks of the aerial assassin. Braving the harsh white blasts of the top of the world or the parched expanses of southern Africa. Or dueling to the death. The wild canines of the world are endlessly adaptable and ingeniously built for the kill.